This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. On Christmas Eve in 1931, a couple made an incredible discovery in the lonely Arizona desert, a baby girl abandoned in a hat box. Today, Sharon Elliott, the so-called hat box baby, wants to learn the truth about her parents and find the couple who rescued her on that long ago Christmas Eve. For 30 years, Joe Shambier has been a real life Santa Claus for the millions of children who listen to his radio broadcasts. But this man who has given children so much happiness is searching for his own child, Alberta Elaine, who was given up for adoption 50 years ago. Also tonight, we will tell the story of John Brandon, a Chicago physician and civil rights worker who was in prison for murdering his wife 20 years ago, a crime he swears he did not commit. Indeed, there is compelling evidence that supports his claim of innocence. If this is true, then a man has been unjustly imprisoned. Tonight, John Branion makes his final appeal. Christmas Eve, 1931. At 8 p.m., a car broke down in the middle of the chilly Arizona desert, 56 miles outside Phoenix. The four people inside were returning from a day trip to the mountains. Ed Stewart took a look at the engine while his wife, Julia, waited in the car. What's wrong, Ed? Uh, looks like a busted fuel line. Yeah, I'll just get to work on it here. Julia's 15-year-old twin cousins, John and Betty Mansfield, looked on from the back seat. Oh, it's just going to take a few minutes to fix. We're hungry. Oh, I know you are, kids. I'm going to stretch my legs a bit. All right. Hey, honey, you be careful out here. There's oh, scorpions. Well. What? Come here, I found something. What is it? It's a hat box. That's probably just some junk left by some campers. Of course, it don't look that weathered. Open it up. Oh my gosh, it's a baby. Good Lord. Who on earth would leave a child out here? I can't believe it. Is she okay? Seems all right. Did you see anybody when we drove up? No. Ed and Julia Stewart saw no sign of the person who had abandoned the baby. They carried the tiny foundling back to their car. Forty-one miles away at the Mesa, Arizona police station, Constable Joe Mayer was spending his Christmas Eve on duty. How's it been tonight? It's been slow, you know, Christmas Eve, people home with their family. Leave it, Joe. Ed, good evening. Julia? Joe, we got a bit of a problem here. We found this baby in the, in the desert. You found the child in the desert? Yeah. yeah we had Ed and Julia Stewart told Constable Mayer the incredible story of how they found the tiny infant in a hat box. You found the baby? Yeah, it was right down in the box. What I'll do is, I don't know exactly what to do with her either. I'll take her to Maud Dana's for tonight. That's yeah, a good she idea, Joe. She'll take we care of her for the night. It's been away no, from our family get, all day. Enjoy yeah. your Christmas. Thank Merry you, Christmas Joe. to you, Joe. And to you, folks. Night. I'll be back to you for a statement on this. All right. Okay? Constable Mayer turned over his young charge to Ma Dana, a midwife living near Florence, Arizona. She sounds real good. Oh, wonderful. Real good. 
You know, I thought she, she called in a doctor who pronounced the child a healthy seven-day-old girl, yeah, suffering no ill effects from her time in the desert. Day or two. She's sure a nice-looking baby. Local reporters were quick to turn up on Ma Dana's porch. They call it the miracle baby? They dubbed the child a miracle. News of the Christmas Eve baby spread like wildfire. People showered the little girl with love, gifts, and attention. Okay, we've got Thank you. We've got Thank you very much. much. We'd never had anything like that happen around Florence. That was a new thing. And uh, everybody was very family-oriented and loved their children and thought of them first to think that somebody would desert a little helpless baby. And we felt it was surely a miracle that night that that little baby was saved. And, uh, You're such a doll. You're going to be just fine. Yeah, we're going to get you a bottle. The miracle Christmas Eve baby captured the imagination of the entire country. To a people weathering the Great Depression, this tiny baby girl, rescued from the desert, became a symbol of the Christmas season and a ray of hope in the midst of bleak times. The baby was put up for adoption. On February the 16th, 1932, a hearing was held at the Pinal County Courthouse in Florence, Arizona. You know, I think this baby must be the most fortunate baby in the county. There Seventeen so couples had expressed interest in adopting the baby, no but the field finally narrowed to just two. I want the other party to know that two Judge E.L. Green faced a difficult choice. Under all circumstances. I might say that since I know you have an adopted child and the other couple doesn't have one, I feel under the circumstances that I am forced to award the child to them. Let them leave the courtroom by themselves. But, Your Honor, I'm going to seal the court records on this case, and we'd appreciate it very much if you boys would respect these people's privacy and let the child grow up in a normal life. Thank you. The reporters and photographers waited inside while the baby and her new parents made their exit. Only the people in court that day knew who had adopted the hatbox baby. For more than half a century, the identity of the family remained a closely guarded secret. Finally, on August the 10th, 1986, the adoptive mother broke her five-decade silence. Sharon, honey, there's something I've got to tell you. We tried to have children and we couldn't. You're adopted, honey. We adopted you when you were a little baby. I'm I was shocked. I just, I couldn't believe it, you know, because I had, I had no idea that I was a, you know, adopted. Nobody ever said a thing to me. It was never, it's just... I never even dreamt it. I, that was the last thing I would think that, you know, I would hear from her. Sharon's mother also told her the amazing saga of how she had been found in the desert. Oh, I've never heard of the Hatbox Baby. And I'm one person, I grew up, and I have a family and everything. Then I'm looking through all these pictures, and it's just, it just seemed like it was unreal, kind of, that this could be me. Sharon began to look for her birth parents. News of her search reached an organization called Orphan Voyage, which reunites adopted children with their families of birth. Alice Simon, one of the research consultants at Orphan Voyage, took up Sharon's cause. Both women felt it was vital to have access to the sealed court documents from 1931. And the court has reviewed your file and determined that it would be in the best interest to release these files. So I'll uh, let you look at them. Okay. And you can... Review it, and after you review it, just leave it with my secretary. Okay, I sure appreciate it. For the first time, Sharon read the Stewart's verbatim account of finding her in the desert. As she studied the records, she grew skeptical of their story. It seemed such an amazing coincidence that their car had broken down at the exact spot in the desert where the hat box had been left. I think it was a setup. Who's going to leave a baby in the desert in the middle? This is this is winter. It's Christmas Eve, and it's that time of you know year it's cold here in sworn testimony ed and julia stewart stated they left home at dawn on december 24th 1931 to drive up to the mountains the stewart said they stopped only once in roosevelt arizona one of several small towns on their route mrs stewart had left an eight-month-old nursing baby at home it was christmas eve the day that most people stay home and cook their turkey 
wrap their Christmas presents. I think that they went up to Globe or Superior or maybe Roosevelt and they picked up the baby from someone they knew, maybe a cousin, a relative, a friend, and brought it back to Mesa. Could the Stewarts have picked up the infant Sharon in Roosevelt or another small town? Or did they indeed find her in the desert? Sharon's mysterious mother having placed her in the hat box only seconds before the Stewarts' car stopped. It would have been a carefully arranged ruse, staged for the benefit of the teenage cousins, John and Betty Mansfield, who'd been brought along as innocent witnesses. In that day, if a girl got pregnant, if, uh, if she was not married, it was, I guess, the greatest disgrace that she could bring upon her family. I think that probably they were just trying to help out a young girl. Maybe it was a relative, could have been a niece, could have been a friend. I, you know, I don't know. Maybe they had friends that had a daughter. Well, I'm just glad that I survived. I don't know if I have any brothers or sisters. I don't even know the exact date of my birth or even where I was born. I don't know what heritage I am, what nationality or where I come from. And I want to know, you know, who I look like. And I think my, you know, my daughter would like to know about, you know, her grandmother too, her real grandmother. The Christmas Eve miracle has remained a mystery for nearly six decades. The vital missing links to Sharon Elliott's lost identity are the couple who found her in the desert. If they are alive, Ed and Julia Stewart would be today in their 80s. Only they know the truth about Sharon Elliott, the woman who began her life 58 years ago as a poignant baby in a hat box, lost in the chill December blackness of an Arizona desert night. When we return the story of a Chicago physician who was convicted of murdering his wife, Dramatic evidence suggests that he may have been unjustly imprisoned. Donna! Donna! December 22, 1967, Chicago, Illinois. A 41-year-old physician named John Brangman and his son Joby arrived home to pick up John's wife, Donna. The family was planning to go Christmas shopping together. Joby and I returned from nursing school and went into the, to the house. And the first thing that struck me was all the lights were on and the two television sets were on. And I called out to Donna. I got no answer. And then when I got to the kitchen, I looked to the right and I could see feet her legs really sticking out of the utility room. Pull it, Joby. And she was dead. Come on, come on, Joby. She wasn't breathing. Her legs were askew, and her skirt was kind of rookered up over her legs. I switched off the light and reached around and grabbed Joby and ran out of the back of the house. After his grim discovery, Dr. Branyan immediately called the police. Five months later, he was on trial for his life. Today, John Branyan is serving a 20 to 30 year term at Illinois' Dixon Correctional Center for the first degree murder of his wife, a crime he swears he did not commit. I think it was an atrocity. I think it was extremely unfair. I feel that it was a setup. My father was railroaded because he didn't kill my mother. I think he's innocent because the evidence shows that he could not have physically been there at the time these events were going on. I think the jury was, was emotionally caught up in the case and just didn't, forgot or didn't pay attention to the evidence that overwhelmingly proved that John couldn't have been the killer. I couldn't murder the mother of my children. I couldn't murder my high school sweetheart. Don and I had known each other since the age of 14. I didn't murder her. It is not uncommon for a convicted criminal to stoutly maintain his innocence. But in John Branyan's case, he is not alone. Though some say he is a murderer, others are convinced that he was framed. For John Branyan, this debate is literally a matter of life and death. After suffering five heart attacks, he desperately needs a heart transplant 
but because he is a convicted murderer, the operation he needs to survive has been denied him. This is John Branion's story. During the mid-60s, when Martin Luther King dreamed his dreams of equality for all Americans, John Branion marched by his side, and in 1966, he was King's personal physician in Chicago. Chicago was a racial battleground during those years, and Branion was often on the front lines. He even went so far as to provide medical services for the Black Panthers, the Weathermen, and other extreme revolutionary groups. Not surprising, Branion was viewed with hostility by the Chicago police. I've always struggled for equal rights and struggled for freedom, hoping that there would eventually be freedom and equal rights. And I've done it all my life. I did it very early in very left-wing groups. And uh, I'll do it when I get out of here. The son of a prominent attorney, John Branion worked at a busy community clinic and lived in Chicago's affluent Hyde Park district. In 1946, he married Donna Brown, and they had two children. December 22, 1967. After being called by John Branion, the Chicago police arrived at his Hyde Park home. Dr. Branion, how are you holding up? I've been OK. Just bear with me. If you noticed anything missing, anything that might have been taken from the apartment. Investigators found four shell casings from a 9 millimeter gun next to Donna's body. They assumed that she had been shot four times. Do you own a 9 millimeter weapon? Yes. Branion was an avid gun collector and says that police asked him for any weapon in his collection capable of firing a 9 millimeter bullet. He gave them a Luger pistol. Wait, Dr. Brennan. Let me get the gun. Thank you. Police determined that the gun had not been recently fired. They would later claim that Brennan had denied owning any other gun capable of firing the fatal bullets. Have a seat here, gentlemen. The same evening at the police station, Brennan gave detectives his alibi. Dr. Brennan, I know it's been a long, difficult day. I'd like to go over one more time your whereabouts for today. Branion told police that he had left the clinic where he worked at 11.30 a.m. Hey, morning. morning. Good. Listen, I'm on my way to pick up Joby. I won't be back anymore this afternoon. Merry Christmas. He then drove to hey, his four-year-old son's nursery school to pick him up. Come on, here's your coat. After leaving the school, they went to see his wife's cousin, Maxine Brown, to meet her for lunch. She was unable to join them. Branion told police that he then proceeded home. There, he discovered the body of his wife. And you arrived home at what time? Around noon. Dr. Branion, would you submit to a lie detector test? John, I don't think that's such a good idea. No, but I, I would like to have a nitrate test, though. We don't have the chemicals. A nitrate test would have determined whether he had fired a gun, but the Chicago police were unable to conduct this test. That night, Brennan was released without being charged. Morning. One month passed. Then on January 22nd, 1968, the police made an unexpected visit to Brennan's clinic. Dr. Brennan, you're under arrest for the murder of your wife. You'll have be? to come with us right now. I think that the police were under a great deal of pressure from the black press at the time. And uh, I think they saw a chance uh, because 85% of murders are committed by either the family or friends, or close friends. They saw a chance to arrest me. And they did. I don't think they thought they were going to convict me but they arrested me anyway. Oh, 
On April 4, 1968, Martin Luther King was gunned down in Memphis, and riots broke out in Chicago. Racial tensions in the city were at an all-time high. In this polarized atmosphere, John Branion's trial began. Would you state your name, please, sir? Michael Boyle. His jury was composed of 11 it's whites and one black. Our profession, sir. I'm the detective for Chicago Police Department. The prosecution's case was built on three assertions. First, although the murder weapon was never found, they claimed that the bullets that killed Donna could have been fired from a Walther PPK that was part of Branyan's gun collection, a gun they maintained yet denied owning. When the detectives testified, they went back to him and said, do you have a Walther PPK? And he said, no, he never had one. And uh, it turned out that that he had, uh, a Walther PPK had been sold about a year before to a man named Hooks, who was one of the good friends of Dr. Branion. The police then went to Hooks and asked him where his gun was, and he said, no, he bought that gun for Branion as a Christmas present the year before. Now, sir, what, if any, relationship did Mrs. Branion bear to you? She uh, was my sister. Later during the trial, Donna Branion's brother, Nelson Brown, testified that John Branion had told him that the day Donna was murdered, his Walther PPK had been stolen from his bedside. He mentioned that there were two guns missing. One was a PPK and the other was a collector's item worth uh, 1500 to $2,000. In the confusion following his wife's death, Branion had not immediately noticed the theft. I show you now that which has been marked as People's Exhibit 13. The prosecution's second assertion was that the four shell casings found by Donna's body had come from a box of ammunition they had discovered when they searched Branyan's closet. Four shells were missing from this box. These are the shells that I recovered from a shelf in the den closet. Finally, the prosecution claimed that John Branyan had a motive for wanting his wife dead. At the time of Donna's death, his marriage was in trouble. For six years, John Branion had been conducting an affair with a nurse at his clinic named Shirley Hudson. His wife knew about the affair, but the couple had not divorced. Our theory of the trial was that it was, it was uh, to get out of a bad marriage, or get out of a marriage without having to uh, pay all the consequences of divorce and, and that. Certainly I had, uh, I had a, a, a friend, a girlfriend, of six years. It wasn't a a hot-on-the-burner affair. There was nothing pressing about our relationship. Our relationship was mutually accepted. Shirley never pressed me. And I never ever thought of leaving Donna. Why would I uh, suddenly decide to kill her? No. Our theory a prosecution was that he had planned for why that day we don't know to kill his wife and that he was going to leave the hospital, come home and kill her, do it silently. When that didn't work, he used the gun. Then pick up his son at school, then pick up Maxine for the luncheon date that was made at the very last minute of the night before, have lunch, have an alibi for the period of time involved, uh, and then have either someone or himself find the body and have a, a very good alibi. Are you ready with your next Branya's witness? defense was simple. He and his attorney were certain Please that his alibi proceed, was gentlemen. airtight, as they maintained it was impossible for Branyan to be in two places at once. Now, Mrs. Kentra, when you got home, did you have occasion to look at your clock? Yes. This what alibi was strengthened was when Branyan's next-door neighbor Five. testified that she had heard the fatal gunshots at 11.20 a.m., while Branyan was reportedly still at his clinic. If the Dr. Branyan's left the hospital at 11.30, and I heard the shots at 11.20, and I'm sure of it. I was sure then, and I'm sure now, that it's impossible for him to shoot his wife, to be there at that time. When you heard those sounds, while you were putting away the groceries... Surprisingly, this testimony would have little impact on the jury. The prosecution pursued their theory that the murder took place after Branyan left the clinic. Yes. Now, officer, you also stated that you drove certain routes and that you totaled these times and that the time you arrived at was from 6 to 12 minutes. Is that right? Yes. Police testified Were that they had the driven and timed Branyan's route on the morning of the murder yes. and had determined that he did, in More fact, running? have just enough time to kill his wife before he picked up his son. Yes. 
And when you arrived at Dr. Branyan's home... However, in one of the trial's most dramatic moments, the defense challenged this timetable. By the way, officer, when you arrived at the nursery school, whose little boy did you use? I don't understand your question, sir. Well, I assume that you went to the nursery school to cover some time about checking on a kid. Now, how much time did you allow for him to pick up his son from the nursery school? We allowed no time for that. You didn't allow that? I can remember uh, feeling a chill in, in the courtroom when he said this, in that you, you are moving a lot slower when you've got a, a child in tow than when you're uh, with your, by yourself. So I thought that was an effective point. Uh, the point of the other point is would he walk into the house knowing his wife was dead with, with the kid? Uh, that's a shocking thing to see if he knew what had happened. So I thought those were the strong points they had going for them. On May 28, 1968, after deliberating for eight hours, the jury reached their decision. Mr. Foreman, has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Read the verdict, Mr. Foreman. We, the jury, find the defendant, John Branion Jr., guilty in manner and form as charged in the indictment. When the judge said I was guilty, the verdict will be entered. I felt hollow. I felt as though I was no longer. But I know what I did do. I remember kind of sticking my head up. I don't know why, but I remember that. I did that. I know my shoulders got a little straighter. But it certainly hurt when he said that. I, it really hurt. For three years, Branyan was free on bail as he appealed his verdict. During this time, he married his former girlfriend, Shirley. I loved him, and I still love him very much. And I could not desert him as people were beginning to do. Uh, he was a walking shell. Uh, he loved both of us. He loved Donna and he loved me. In April of 1971, his appeal was denied and John Branion was ordered to begin serving his 20 to 30 year sentence. A few days later, after the Supreme Court declined to hear his case, Branyan jumped bail and left the country. For 12 years, Branyan lived in Africa, but in 1983, he was apprehended in Uganda. He was brought back to Illinois to serve his sentence. An innocent person should be found innocent in this country. We've been taught that ever since we were kids. So because of that, I had to flee because I couldn't get justice anywhere else. The evidence against me proves that I couldn't have done the crime, yet I'm here. They printed up the crime scene photos from the negatives for me to look Currently, at. two investigators yeah. have volunteered and their and services to Branya's case. There's Anthony a D'Amato, a prominent law professor from Northwestern there. University, so and his wife, author Barbara D'Amato, are working with Branyan's wife, Shirley, kind of to document what they consider to be a shocking they miscarriage of justice. They typed the blood in the back bedroom when uh, Mrs. Branyan said, my husband was innocent, I was very skeptical about that. I don't, I don't tend to believe people's statements about things like this. And it was only Barbara's investigation of the thing that proved to me that no matter what John Branyan said, he couldn't have done it. That was the, ma the amazing thing about this case. It was an impossibility case, not a case of somebody's word against somebody else's word. John Branyan is currently serving his sentence in Illinois for the 1967 murder of his wife, Donna. He could be incarcerated until the year 2006. But Tony and Barbara D'Amato believe he deserves to be released immediately. They claim that by reconstructing the events that took place in the late morning of December 22nd, 1967, it can be proved that John Branyan did not shoot his wife. The fact is that when uh, his wife was murdered. He was a mile and a half away treating patients in a hospital. And that's proven. That's a fact. So there's no, there's no legal rule whatsoever that says an innocent man has to stay in prison. Okay. Now stay off this. 
Okay. okay. All right. As it cannot definitely be proved that the fatal shots were fired at 11.20, then it is possible that Donna was murdered later. Branyan's guilt or innocence might rest on the 10-minute window of time between 11.35 when he left his clinic and the time that he arrived at the nursery school to pick up his son. What well, seemed to be a trouble, kid? Oh, my stomach, doctor. A lot of pain. John Branyan spent the morning of December 22nd at his clinic, where he saw 14 different patients. Three to four times a day. At approximately 11.35, Branyan left the clinic located here and stopped outside to talk with Leonard Scott, the hospital's administrator. He was next seen by a teacher at his son's nursery school here, approximately 10 minutes later. In order to have murdered Donna, Branyan would have had to have driven to his home, shot his wife, and then raced to his son's school, all in less than 10 minutes. You know, there's no way the police could have made this in six minutes. During the trial, police claimed that this drive could be made in as little as six minutes. But according to the D'Amato's, the police grossly underestimated the actual time this drive would take. The D'Amato's traveled the same route several times. It took them at least 11 minutes. The police testified that they got it down as low as six minutes, but they also said that they sometimes it took them 12 minutes. Well, that's a huge disparity between six and 12. And I just wonder how, how they could have pulled off that six minutes. And they certainly couldn't have done it at a time when there were other cars on the street or pedestrians or snow or anything else like the conditions that John Branion had to drive it in. It's one thing to say, well, if you're going to kill your wife, you can speed and hurry up to get home, but you can't drive through a car ahead of you. And if the streets are filled with pedestrians and people crossing the streets and other kinds of cars, it was just clearly impossible. Out of the bedroom and around the corner, and she would have been resisting. Yes. Further evidence that Branyan could not have shot his wife came when the D'Amato's consulted pathologist, Douglas Shanklin. After examining the original autopsy reports on Donna Branyan, Shanklin believes he can prove that she was first assaulted at least a half hour before John Branyan had even begun to drive home, an attack he believes would have required at least two assailants. It's very important to note that there were bruises and other marks on her body, uh, the most particular of which is a groove in her neck. It was a very deep groove that began in the anterior neck and moved laterally and then disappeared behind as though somebody was standing in back with a taut cord, not strong enough to strangle a person, but strong enough to hold them, to move their body as you wish them to move and to restrain them from escape. And of course, as soon as he was shot, the cord was released, this groove stayed there. It's not going to continue to form after death because of the loss of circulation. It takes at least 15 minutes for such a groove to be formed, and possibly longer. So you've got a minimum of 15 minutes before the gun is used. The latest time and testimony for those sounds was approximately 11.25. So that pushes the beginning of the court around the neck 15 minutes earlier, and it seems to me that the crime began probably around 11 o'clock or a few minutes before that. So she would lie that way in the alcove, and that would mean... I think Dr. Brannion is innocent of this crime because there were two people at least involved one of whom held the victim for a period of time, but could not have shot at the same time. Bang, bang, she falls. So there had to be two parties to the final action of this scenario. But even if Donna Branion was killed by two assailants while her husband was at work, former prosecutor Patrick Tewitt believes that Branion may still be guilty. I always, even at the time of trial, had doubts as to whether he actually pulled the trigger. That was our theory of the prosecution. Uh, but I always felt, and I still feel, that he was somehow responsible for his death. He is a man that deals with facts. If there are facts that say that I did not kill my wife, but I hired someone else, then let him come forth with them. How, what gives him the right, the arrogance, to say that he believes something when there's no evidence of it? If there was a second party involved, why didn't they get the second party and hang us both? There is no basis in the law whatsoever to say, oh, well, if he wasn't there, he hired someone to do it. 
it's the jury should hear if there was any evidence of anyone being hired. And if they didn't, if the state chose not to present that theory, then it is legally irrelevant. Today, John Branion and the D'Amato's have exhausted all avenues of judicial appeal. Branion's only hope is clemency from the governor of Illinois, a clemency that cannot be delayed much longer, for John Branion needs a heart transplant that will be denied him as long as he remains in prison. Convicted murderers are not put on the waiting list for heart transplants. So he's almost, you know, he has a double death sentence. Uh, he's already in prison for a crime that he did not commit. And then he can't get the medical care that he needs to continue living. So in essence, he has a death sentence. Tonight, John Branion is in prison, and for him, time is running out. Is he a murderer or an innocent victim? If Branion's operation is delayed much further, the answer will make little difference. In a moment, the poignant story of a real-life Santa Claus who has given happiness to children across the country. But today, Joseph Shambier wants a Christmas present of his own to speak with his long-lost daughter. All of us are familiar with the department store Santas and street corner Santas who appear each December. These jolly men are cheerful symbols of the season. Yet our next story is about a Santa Claus who, behind his jaunty smile, has been hiding a broken heart for more than 40 years. Tonight, maybe you can help bring about a happy ending to this story, which we call Santa's Baby. The story begins toward the end of the Great Depression. In 1937, the economy was slowly beginning to improve, but Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania remained hard hit. Bread lines were still a common sight, Good jobs were hard to come by. 20-year-old Joseph Felix Shambier could find work only as a Western Union delivery boy. Against the backdrop of his bleak, depression-hit city, Joe did, however, find a wife. He and Garnet Ulri, two loners without family ties of their own, fell in love and married. They were both eager to begin a family. Two months after the wedding, Garnet became pregnant. On June 16, 1939, I was at work at, at uh, Western yeah. Union. I had 14 cents in my pocket. <laughs> Felix, Felix, you better get a move on. Your wife's just gone to leave her. What? Yeah, just came in on the phone. My wife's gone to labor. She's having a baby. She's Neither I baby. nor Garnet had any idea that this would happen so suddenly. We had given it like an additional couple of weeks. The doctor thought it would be an additional couple of weeks, but that wasn't so. Needless to say, I ran up the three flights of stairs and I was excited, very excited. Garnet was further along in her labor than Joe had expected. The landlady had called for a doctor, but he had not yet arrived. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Here, hold on to my belt. There, now pull up. Hold on that tight. Okay. Uh, I think the baby's coming. Uh, I didn't expect uh, that baby to come rushing out and say hello right off the bat uh, without the doctor being there. That's my girl. Come on. You know, that that's that's quite a shock to the system. A little more, sweetheart. The two of us were so elated. It was like a package sent from heaven. At one o'clock in the afternoon, the doctor finally walked in. He pronounced both mother and daughter in good health and congratulated the new parents. Little baby girl, huh? Garnet, for the better part of an hour or so, 
had the baby in her arm, and she kept talking about it. And, uh, you know, it was quite, you'd have never known that she had gone through this misery of giving birth. She was so pleased with it. And I was, too, because, my goodness, look at that pretty girl. She got a little bit tired, and I didn't have a bassinet, so what I did was wrap the baby up in the blanket, and I placed her in the draw. We had a, a, a bureau dresser there with three draws. The bottom draw was quite long and large, and so forth. So I made a bed in there and placed the baby in there, temporarily. And then uh, Garnet had a short nap and woke up again and started speaking in a strange fashion. For example, Felix, if anything happens to me, make sure Alice Miller gets the baby. Well, Alice raised Garnet, so to speak. There was a relationship there, more like a second mother. They were very close. Take care of the baby, Alberta. Four o'clock, she just died. No fight, no sufferings, nothing of that sort. Gonna wake up, what's wrong? I was numb. I was absolutely numb. So I followed her that that wish. I did what I thought I was supposed to do. Joe took his baby daughter, Alberta Elaine, to Alice Miller. You gonna be a good little girl for Mrs. Miller, Alberta Elaine? Everything will be all right. There was a sense of relief in that I knew that the baby would be well taken care of. She'd be brought up properly. Are you sure it's not too much trouble? Oh, no trouble at all. We'll have a good time. Well, I appreciate it. I know this is what Garnet wanted. God rest her soul. Alice was a very conscientious woman, very loving, caring person, good common sense. She was a typical good American woman. Don't worry. Thank you, ma'am. Good jobs were still almost impossible to find. So one week before Pearl Harbor, Joe Shambier enlisted. He felt the Army was his best chance to give some financial security to his tiny daughter. Joe was assigned to basic training in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, then shipped out to the Pacific Theater. His little daughter never left his mind. And all during the time that I was in the service, I kept a a little prayer book here, a little manual is what it's called. And inside that manual is a picture of my daughter. It's the only picture that I have of her. I wrote to the Millers several times. I, I don't know, five, six times, but I never received a reply. No communications with Alice at all, all during the time I was in the Army. In August of 1943, Joe suffered a head injury during air raid drills in the Panama Canal Zone. After treatment, he was plagued with intermittent neck and back pain, so he was shipped to a Boston hospital for further treatment. On the way, his plane stopped in Pittsburgh. At the Allegheny Airport, when we landed, we had a half an hour to refuel, and I asked permission to call Alice Miller. After all, she had the baby, and I wanted to find out about the baby, how she was doing, and so forth. The baby was roughly five years old at the time. Hello. This strange voice, a Mrs. woman, answered, and uh, when I told her who I was, uh, she said that I was supposed to be dead, that the baby had been adopted. Bang. Went to receive her. Ah, you gotta go. The nameless woman on the telephone left Joe dumbfounded. She said Alberta Elaine's adoption records were sealed and he would never see his daughter again. Well, it's a blow, to say the least. It's a blow. It's enough to blow your mind. Despite Joe's best efforts, he could not locate his baby daughter. He never stopped trying to find her. 
In 1946, he married for the second time, then moved to New England, where he worked as a clerk at the Veterans Administration. One year later, at Christmas time, Joe phoned a little girl in his neighborhood pretending to be Santa Claus. Oh, 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 oh. So this is Santa Claus calling from the North Pole. The little girl was delighted. Soon all the other neighborhood children were clamoring for Santa to call them. By the next Christmas, a local radio station had put Joe on the air. Soon, thanks to newspaper articles across the country, telephone operators everywhere were referring young callers who asked to speak to Santa Claus to Joe Shambier. What would you like for Christmas? I'm writing this down in my big book. That's not work. It's a challenge. But you know deep down that you're doing something good, and at the same time, you are looking for that needle in the haystack, namely Alberta Elaine. That would be a heaven sent, to be able to look at her, be able to sit down with her, talk with her, maybe give her a big hug if she would let me. Hey, it's my own flesh and blood, and she deserves to know what took place. every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. Thank you.